Hey everybody, I'm Jeff Chandler. I'm the National Technical Coordinator with CASI. And uh, thanks for tuning in. I'm going to talk today about our Level 3 program. So um, Level 3, both the course and the Level 3 exam process. And I'm really going to touch mostly, I think, on the Level 3 standards. Um, just to give you a, a bit of an idea of what's involved with the Level 3 certification and um, what to expect if you do go on the exam and then follow through and go on the, on the uh, or sorry, if you go on the course and then follow through and go on the exam. So um, what we're looking at here is the CASI website. I'm just going to toggle off my camera here and I'm going to go to the courses page. And if you haven't been here yet, um, the level three uh, course page is the first place I'm going to go. And from this point, I'm going to click on resources and then I'm going to open up and download the level three course guide. So this is the level three course guide right here. And if you haven't uh, gone in and cracked this open, there's a lot of good info. Um, this is kind of the roadmap to the level three certification. Uh, there's a lot of stuff in here. It's a pretty extensive document. Uh, it goes through the agenda info, a lot of the evaluation procedures and standards. Uh, there's some workshops and some resources, the technical presentations. So the stuff that you'll be presented with on snow. And then there's some, uh, uh, evaluation forms. <clears throat> so uh, just regarding the introduction, I mean, the first sentence says the CASI level three instructor certification is for advanced snowboard instructors who have passed the level two and have an interest in teaching high end snowboarders. So um, if you're interested in working with advanced riders, then obviously the level three is the place to go. Uh, but really what I would focus in on here is this idea of the, the am I ready section here. Um, the level three instructor standards require you to pass riding, teaching and instructor training evaluations. So we break down the certification into three different parts. The, the riding part obviously is your technical skill. The teaching part is the, uh, your ability to improve the riding of an advanced snowboarder or refine the riding of an advanced snowboarder. And then the instructor training part is where we're actually passing on teaching skills and teaching tools to newer and newer or less experienced, less experienced instructors. Um, and so the, the different points here under the am I ready section here, the first one is really important. Spend plenty of time working as an instructor. This is a big, and I talk to a lot of people who maybe pass the level two and then immediately focus in and zero in on the level three, which is a great uh, goal. My big word of advice to most people, though, is don't rush that process, especially from the level two to the three. I'd say of all of our four courses, four levels, the jump from two to three is the biggest jump. So uh, one to two is definitely a step up and three to four is also a step up, but the step from two to three is probably the largest. So don't rush that process. There's a lot of things that you'll learn by teaching a lot of different people. And uh, if you're in a position to even teach other instructors and start to figure out what that's all about, um, you know, teaching a lot of different ability levels in your lessons, you'll learn a lot of things from just being in the field and putting in your time and putting in the hours. Uh, you'll pick up a lot of skills that aren't, you aren't able to get on a, an actual course. So I think that first one is really important. Uh, the second one, ensure you're familiar with the CASI level one and two course content. So we do go into some of the level two, um, um, or sorry, some of the level one material on the level three course when it comes to teaching beginners and passing on that ability to teach beginners to new instructors. So at the very least, I would make sure you're, um, you've sort of uh, brushed up on the level, uh, the level one stuff from the reference guide. So the teaching beginner section of the reference guide, and then the um, teaching intermediate snowboarder section from the, the skill development section of the re reference guide as well, which is essentially the level two content. And then the third part, if you have the ability or you have the resources, attend a training session or training sessions with a current CASI level three instructor and even better, a level three evaluator. And the level three evaluator will really be able to have a good sort of look at your riding, uh, assess sort of your skills and see where you're at and give you some good suggestions for whether or not to progress onto that course. Um, and then the next part, the course duration. So basically it's five days. The course portion is five days and it's, uh, the course portion only. And then the second part is the evaluation or the exam portion. And that's two days. So 
we used to lump these two together back when the course was four days and the exam was two days and we would offer it as a six day program. Um, we typically don't do that anymore. We try to schedule the course and the exam separate from each other. And the reason that we do that is to try to encourage people to take some time between the course and the exam to um, do some training. So you'll come away from the course with some feedback, uh, a pretty extensive feedback form, not to mention five days of riding and, and uh, feedback on the hill. Um, and the perfect scenario is that you would take that course and then you would take that back to your resort and work with your trainers at your resort and uh, work on improving those skills and then come back later on in the season and then sit the exam. That's not always possible and we do sometimes schedule the course and the exams together. Uh, the big thing to keep in mind if you're going to do the course and the exams together, there's a few things to keep in mind, but the big one is that seven days, five days on a course is a long time and if you tack on two extra days, that's a really long time to be engaged mentally and physically and uh, emotionally. So it's a, it's a long process for sure. Um, and so uh, my first recommendation is always to uh, tackle them separately, but there are some people who prefer to kind of do it all in, in one shot. <clears throat> um, so this is the agenda for the instructor course uh, where it's broken down into the three different modules where you've got the instructor training module, uh, the advanced skill development, which is the advanced teaching or basically refining the skills of advanced riders module and the, and the uh, riding part <clears throat> and the riding part kind of takes place throughout the duration of the five days. And then the pre-course workshops section here at the bottom of the agenda. This part is really important. We have a standards video, which is online on our YouTube channel. You can access it also through the level three course page. And it's basically a riding standards video. So it gives you some visuals on what type of performance level we're looking for on the riding. But we also have a level three e-prep workshop, which is new as of last year, and that's accessible from the level three course page as well. And really the level three e-prep is a good way to prepare yourself for the course portion by covering some of that level one content. It'll give you a bit of a teaser on some of the stuff that you'll talk about in the instructor training module. Um, and then it'll uh, also kind of refresh your memory from the level two on some of the riding uh, theory as far as the skills concept and some of the competencies and that type of thing. So definitely do the e-prep workshop beforehand. You can do it even if you're, you're, it's open to everybody. You can, if you're not planning or registered on a course, you can even do the level three e-prep. Um, and you might pick up some new some new ideas there. And then the level three exam agenda is the next thing that follows here. And it's a two day exam where we focus mostly on the first day on the teaching evaluations. And then on the second day, we get into the instructor training and the writing evaluations. So starting on page four here, this is the really the meat of what I wanted to talk about um, here in this presentation. And this is the evaluation section. So this cut kind of covers uh, really what is involved with the level three uh, certification on the standard side. So the first thing there says candidates must pass the teaching, technical or riding and instructor training components of the course to be certified as a level three instructor. So um, following that, it just sort of breaks down how the different parts are marked. So the riding evaluation, how it's marked, each is marked on a below meets or above standard scale. So there's no number marks here. Um, the teaching evaluation and then the instructor training evaluation at the bottom. So we'll talk first about the riding evaluations and basically the way that we assess the riding skills of level three candidates is through a series of tasks or maneuvers. So on the left hand side of the table here, these two are done on groom terrain, the long and short turns. And on the right side, uh, we have our short turns in ungroomed terrain and then our freestyle skills. Um, on the left side, on the groomed terrain, it's important to note here that we don't specify carved turns and sliding turns, which we have done in the past over the years, and we've gone away from that. And really the reason is more on the long turn side, um, we've specified uh, blue terrain for the large turns or the long turns. And if the conditions are good or if the conditions are ideal, then those turns, chances are, will be carved turns. So the performance level that we're looking at in those turns is... Um, you know, ideally it would be a, a pencil line track in the snow with some good, some good performance, but we don't always get perfect, um, conditions or ideal conditions for that. So sometimes they end up being kind of a partially sliding turn. Um, and that's fine. We're not expecting, um, we're not specifying a maneuver here. We're, we're really more concerned with the mechanics and the, 
um, the movements that create a long turn and the movements that uh, create a short turn. The terrain has stepped up a little bit for the second one, the short turns and groomed terrain. So we go from more of a blue terrain to kind of blue and black. And it's worth noting that this is always condition dependent. So if you show up for your level three exam and the, the conditions are, are perfect and ideal and nice and grippy and soft snow, um, then you can expect that we'll sort of stick to this terrain. But if you turn up and it's rained the night before and then frozen overnight, the evaluators who are, or whoever is working that exam will make that judgment call as to, um, you know, maybe lessening the difficulty of the terrain to allow for um, a better kind of showcasing of skills. And then on the right side of the table here, we've got our short turns and ungroomed terrain. Basically, this would be a similar size, short radius turn, two to three board lengths in width, but done in ungroomed terrain. So um, getting into kind of bumpy terrain, I would hesitate to call it full-on bumps or moguls like a black mogul run uh the intention with this is it's more of a terrain adaptation type task uh sometimes i know in ontario specifically sometimes really all we've got to work with are our bumps um are pretty big moguls we try to if that's the case we try to be aware of the difficulty level and the size of the bumps um, but ideally this is ungroomed terrain <clears throat> um, kind of a free ride or an off-piece kind of situation. And then the fourth one is this freestyle skills. And this is um, just reading from the page. Candidates will be asked to demonstrate consolidation level skills of basic free riding, basic freestyle riding elements. So when we talk about consolidation level skills, we're talking about that ability to be comfortable in that environment and um, show comfort show comfort in demonstrating those basic elements. Um, and we'll talk more about the specifics on the freestyle riding side. Um, so then we get into the teaching evaluations. Candidates will be asked to teach one advanced skill improvement lesson of approximately 30 to 35 minutes. Um, so this is a basically a half hour skill development session or a skill development lesson, uh, an advanced teaching session. So um, the next session or the next sentence says the evaluation staff will direct the lesson, including terrain, the number of students and the teaching order of the group on the exam day. So this is a 30 minute, basically a 30 to 35 minute window for you to show that you can improve the skills of the people that you're in the group with. We don't assign a teaching evaluation topic anymore. So we used to say, um, okay, as of last year, we used to say, this is your lesson and I, we'd like you to improve our uh, spins in the park or help us ride better in the trees or help us to carve on steeper terrain. Um, we're no longer doing that. So the, the, top, the lesson topic is really up to you as the candidate to assess the people that you're riding with, the people in your group, your fellow candidates or your peers, and decide what's really going to help them um, to improve their riding. Uh, the level three, what I always sort of say to everybody is that the level three is really the point in the progression, the CASI uh, certification progression, where the riding skills of the candidates or the potential instructors and the riding skill of the theoretical student really converge. So at the level one, we're always talking about teaching down to a beginner. And at the level two, even, we're talking about the instructor kind of um, teaching more of a lower end kind of intermediate rider. But by the level three now, it's very conceivable that your riding skill will match or be very close to the riding skill of your student. And so your ability to assess what's going on in their riding, make some decisions on what make, will make them better, and then tailor a, a skill development uh, lesson to that is the key. That's really what we're looking for there. And then on the instructor training evaluation, the third part here, candidates will be asked to present a basic instructor training session, approximately 20 minutes in duration, geared towards new snowboard instructors. Um, so basically what we're talking about here is teaching new snowboard instructors how to teach better. Uh, and these could be new level ones or lesser experienced level ones, or they could be people just going through the level one process. Um, and then it says candidates will be pre-assigned two portions to build the session as a teaching skill and then a quick ride system phase. So essentially what we're asking you to do in this instructor training session is teach the group how to effectively teach a part of the quick ride system, zeroing in on some, some important part of teaching. Um, and so the practical teaching skills, if you've um, 
uh, if you've gone through the teaching theory section of the reference guide, the practical teaching skills would be things like guest service and safety, communication and lesson structure, demonstrations, analysis and improvement, that type of thing. So an example of a session topic might be um, teach us how to teach the basic step of quick ride and focus on guest service and safety as the teaching skill. So that just keeps you kind of zeroed in on one part of the, of the teaching skills there. So the next part always comes up in a, in a lot of questions. So what happens with retests? So basically we have three por portions of the core of the certification, the teaching, the writing and the instructor training. And so it says candidates passing individual components will never have to be retested for that component and will retain that component for life. So if you sit the exam and you pass the teaching portion, but maybe you're unsuccessful in the riding and the instructor or the instructor training and the riding, sorry, um, you'll keep that teaching portion for life. Um, and you'll just continue to, to work towards completing the other two that were missed. Following completion of the level three course portion, candidates are qualified to attend the level three exams and there's no time limit to complete the exams. Candidates may retake the level three course portion as many times as necessary while completing the certification process. So you can uh, attend the exams as many times as you need to, to complete the components of the course that you need to get the certification done, basically, is what that's saying. Um, so we always get a lot of questions about that, if there's a time limit on it, and we did remove the time limit on that, uh, the retest time limit um, last year, I believe it was. So then we get into the specific assessment criteria. Um, and it says refer to the marking form for specific criteria. So further on, later on in this book, um, in this PDF, we've got samples of the uh, the actual marking forms that will be used on the, the level three course. So that's here, here's a comment form, and then these are the marking forms. And those have the specific criteria, but they're pretty well uh, communicated here in this section, in the assessment criteria section. So the first one is teaching. So the big goal here with the teaching assessment or your ability to teach advanced riders is uh, listed on the left side here, and that's teaches advanced snowboarding skills in accordance with Cassie, Cassie technique and methodology. So, and then it, that gets broken down on the side here. So on the, from a technical standpoint, um, the lesson is skill-based and, and skill component-based applied to specific maneuvers or parts of the turn, identifies areas for improvement and provides positive, relevant, and individual feedback um to achieve advanced riding competencies in varied terrain or in groomed ungroomed and freestyle terrain and then tactics drills and exercises should be relevant to the student trial it should help students improve so basically what that's saying here is that we're looking for uh we're looking for you to zero in on one of the skills the riding skills whether it's position balance pivot edging pressure timing um, and more importantly zero in and focus on a specific part of the skill. And so one of the big aspects of the level three course is taking the skills concept and those big, broad general skills and breaking them down into their sub components. So for example, the skill of position and balance, we can break down into um, uh, balance and stability or pivot. We could talk about rotation versus counter rotation. Uh, within edging, we might zero in on inclination more so than angulation. And that's what we mean by skill component based lessons. So being more specific than just we're going to work on edging today, maybe it's we're going to work on our uh, inclination skills <clears throat> to improve a, a carved turn, perhaps. Um, the class management here, and this is where a lot of those skills come from being just an experienced instructor. So chooses terrain that's both suitable and safe, adapts the lesson to changing terrain and environmental conditions. So this is a key word, this adaptability word. Um, a level three instructor or an advanced instructor should really not be thrown off by kind of changes that are thrown at them from the environment or from the terrain and working in a resort environment. So if you anticipate the terrain or the conditions to be one thing and they aren't quite that there, um, how can you make that make it a useful uh, tool anyway? Demonstrate safe teaching practices at all times. So that's our risk management side of things paces a lesson to cater to advanced riders or students and encourages mileage. So pacing is really important. And so we all know as advanced riders, if we took a, if we take a lesson, uh, we want to be riding. So there's a, always a fine balance between, um, you know, going too fast and not including enough technical information and going too slow and kind of boring, boring the group. So it's finding that pace where we feel like there's some, some movement and some action but uh, also some teaching and some technical info getting through. 
And then the third part, communication and demonstration skills. So communicates effectively, providing clear explanations. So your ability to just relay these concepts in simple terms and make a, an advanced rider understand them is important. Communicates in a positive and enthusiastic manner, obviously. Uh, demonstrates a positive attitude and body language. Relays complex ideas in a simple way. Um, that's a, that's a key here. So we're talking about some pretty um, complicated kind of concepts in some cases here, and how can we uh, present them to snowboarders in a way that is easy to understand? That's a that's a real um, important skill of an advanced instructor. Uh, clearly demonstrates all relevant maneuvers and adapts technical demos to the skill level of the student. So your demonstration skills and your ability to demonstrate some of this stuff is really uh, really comes into play on your on the teaching side <clears throat> um, and so that's kind of the overview of what we're looking for from your lesson from the actual advanced lesson and like I said it's a 30 to 35 minute window and really we're not uh, we're not assigning anything except for giving you some guidance on terrain we may ask you to start at the top of a groomed run we may end up at the top of the park and ask you to start there uh, or maybe we're standing on kind of a bumpier pitch um, but that's really all the direction that you'll get. And from there, it's about assessing the riders that you have and trying to incorporate these points, these bullet points into the lesson that you present to them. Um, so the second part here, the riding skills assessment. So demonstrates refined, advanced level riding skills. <clears throat> so we're looking for that level of refinement uh, and precision from uh, from your riding in terms of your own skills. And if you... Um, if you want to review, you could go to the reference guide and look at the skill development section. And at, right at the start of the skill development section, there's a chart that talks about the IACRCV model, which talks about initiation, acquisition, consolidation, and refinement. And the refinement will sort of break down how, you know, what does refinement of skills really look like? But the first one rides consistently on advanced terrain, groomed, ungroomed, and freestyle at adequate speeds. So we talk a lot on the level three course about this idea of adequate speed. So if we're trying to get performance and we're trying to get the snowboard to bend, there's kind of an optimum speed window where um, if we're going too fast, then the forces are too great and we're not able to generate performance. Um, and we probably end up just kind of blowing out or crashing or whatever. But also if we're going too slow, if we're going, if we're riding too slow, then we're not generating the momentum and the forces that we need to bend the snowboard. So adequate speeds doesn't mean fast, but it doesn't mean slow. It means uh, advanced level speeds. Uh, displays refinement of the three basic riding competencies or what we've changed now to the core riding competencies. So if you think back to your level one and two, we've got those three, three core competencies, which are kind of just a, a checklist for good intermediate riding of centered and mobile, turning with the lower body and balance over the working edge. And then in the level three course, we get into advanced riding and we look at uh, the next section, which is the advanced riding competencies of strength and flow, arc to arc, loading and deflection and steering versatility. And this is where the core competencies kind of get expanded into the advanced realm. And so these four, um, four competencies really help us to be uh, performance focused in our riding and also in our teaching when we're working with students. Um, but they also really help to filter through um, kind of the, the checklist of what does an advanced rider do, and um, at least when we're teaching anyway, kind of zero in on one of them that may be showing some weakness and decide what to, what to teach, what to focus in on if we're teaching an advanced rider. But in your own riding, we're looking for you to demonstrate those four things uh, at a consolidation level at least, so at a very con fairly consistent level. We're not looking for um that refinement or creative variation yet the level three with these competencies but we're looking for you to be have them consolidated in your riding uh, and then adjust the skills to provide technically sound demonstrations which are easy to copy and so that's where the overlap from the teaching skill of, or the demonstration skill from the teaching side comes in so then we get into the specifics of some of these tasks so the specific criteria so on the groom terrain the short and long terms um, balances against the turning forces to create pressures to create pressure in the board. So what we're talking about here is getting the mass to the inside of the turn so that the board bends. <clears throat> um, we talk a lot about angulation for getting edge grip, but don't underestimate the need for inclination at this level. We need to lean. Uh, we need to lean and get our center of mass to the inside of the turn in order to counteract the forces that are coming. And especially at this advanced level, if we're riding at adequate speeds, 
we need to incline, we need to lean to the inside and get that board bending. Um, regulates pressure and maintains snow contact through flexion and extension movements. So we're not specifying uh, up versus down on weighting, an up on weighted movement versus a down on weighted movement. And that's simply because when you snowboard, you select the movement that is needed at the time. And so we would rarely ever only up on weight or rarely ever down on weight. And most likely what we would do is usually a combination of the two. And so we're asking you in the, in the groom terrain uh, tasks here anyway, short and long turns to select the up on weighted movement or down on weighted movement or a combination of the two kind of more of a mid weighted movement to keep the board in contact with the snow. Uh, adjust the movements to create sliding or carved turns as required by terrain and speed. And so that's where we get into this idea of long turns versus carved turns. If the, if the terrain uh, allows, then carved turns are a great way to show high-end skill or advanced riding skill. Um, and if the terrain or the conditions don't necessarily allow for that, are you able to just kind of finely tune the amount of edge that you're using but keep the general sort of movements and mechanics there to, um, to maybe adjust to more of a sliding turn. Uses lower body movements to lead the turning effort in a variety of turn shapes and sizes. So we're looking for efficient use of the lower body, so the knees and the feet to direct the board with a quiet, uh, more or less a quiet upper body with minimal kind of adjustment, large gross movements through the arms and the upper body for adjustments of balance links momentum between turns so carrying momentum from one turn to the next is really important so exiting the the uh the previous turn and directing the momentum into the next turn as opposed to looking at each turn as a separate effort and controls and redirects the snowboard so at that transition point um, are you redirecting the snowboard effectively into the next turn or are you losing control of that release of the board or that rebound and not able to direct it into the next turn and then in the ungroomed terrain for the short radius turns, we talk a lot about regulating pressure and maintaining snow contact through flexion and extension movements. So this is that ability to take that up and down and waiting and that pressure control sort of idea and apply it to varied terrain to keep the board in contact with the snow. So part of that is looking ahead, a part of it is line selection, but it's really about regulating pressure and, and anticipating what's going to happen with the pressures acting on the board ahead of time. Chooses effective lines in varied terrain, so your ability to choose a line that allows you to show performance is big. Um, and uh, that idea of that sort of more timing kind of concept of looking ahead and choosing the line. Adjust body position to terrain and snow conditions. Um, and adjust the movements to the terrain features. So the pace of your movements uh, and the body position that you adopt will, should really be directed by the speed you're moving, the terrain that you're standing on at the time or riding through at the time, and the type of snow conditions that you're riding. And displays refined use of pressure control and steering skills. So are you able to turn the board quickly in tight situations in those ungroomed sort of terrain or even bumpy terrain and refined use of pressure control, so that absorption skill of keeping the board in, co uh, in contact with the snow. And then we get to the last part, the freestyle skills. And this is always the big one for most people who go out on the, who, who are thinking about the level three uh, certification. So we are assessing your ability to uh, demonstrate basic freestyle skills. Um, chances are in the park, potentially not. You, you will be in the park at some point in the course and, and the exam, but we're talking about freestyle skills that could in, um, in theory be, be performed outside of the park as well. The freestyle aspect of the riding exam, for one reason or another, seems to cause a lot of apprehension on, uh, amongst a lot of level three candidates. And for me, uh, it's kind of misplaced, the apprehension there, because really the performance level that we're looking at from the freestyle part of the riding is probably the lowest of all three of the, the tasks. So if you're able, if you're, you know, some of the stuff that we're asking for from the, the groomed and the ungroomed terrain, in my opinion, it's much higher on the difficulty scale than um, than the freestyle stuff. But I recognize that the freestyle and the park riding in general has a certain, uh, it creates a certain amount of nervousness in uh, candidates. Um, and so it's important just to keep in context what we're actually looking for here. So it demonstrates consolidation of basic freestyle skills on small and some medium features inside and outside of the terrain park. So we need to leave it open to small and medium features just because 
the difference between a small and medium feature in uh, Whistler is much different sometimes than a small or medium feature in um, at Blue Mountain or Mount St. Louis. So um, we're generally looking at the basic skills and the smaller end of the spectrum, the introductory sort of features when it comes to the jumps and the rails and the boxes. Um, but specifically, what are we looking for? So demonstrates mobility and balance on basic box and or rail features by demonstrating shifties and or board slide maneuvers. So what we're looking for there is can you get on a box or a rail and have the balance skill to move the board through a shifty or through a board slide, front side or back side, um, rather than just simply riding across a box or rail feature so quickly that there is really no need for balance. So getting the board to sort of lock onto the feature and then be, have the presence of mind and the comfort and the, and the balance to move the board there. Demonstrates mobility and balance in the air by demonstrating straight airs with grabs. So can you um, maintain an effective body position at the takeoff, in the air of a jump, and then on the landing, and get the board up somewhere close to your hand so you can show a straight air with a grab? And then creates, uh, creates and controls rotation on box and rail features and in the air by using the torso to create rotation and the eyes and extremities to control the spins. Um, and then the extension to that is demonstrates the ability to stop rotations on landing by using the eyes and the extremities as well as the vertical flexion of the legs. So this is one that really throws people um, and probably causes the most kind of nervousness is, and this is the rotations. So what we're looking for is can you create rotation and by create rotation by initiating with a counter rotation movement and then a rotational movement through the center, through the torso, the middle part of the body at the takeoff. That would be as opposed to creating rotation through counter rotation. Um, so the, the key to getting to bigger spins and getting your students that you're teaching to bigger spins is to be able to use this mechanical, mechanically sound method of, uh, of uh, a pre-wind or a counter rotation followed by a rotational movement uh, to initiate a spin. <clears throat> counter rotation spins were great up to 180 degrees, but if you want to go past that 180 mark, uh, it's really important to be able to generate the spin through the rotate through the torso. And then the second part, using the eyes and the extremities to control the spin. So using the eyes to spot the landing, looking through the rotation to complete maybe the full 180 or the full 360. Uh, and then the extremities as well. So placing the arms wider or narrower to slow or, or speed up the spin. And then the second part demonstrates the ability to stop rotation on landing by using the eyes and extremities as well as vertical flexion of the legs. So we see this quite often on the level three exam where someone might be able to do the, do the 180 or do the 360, show a really good kind of uh, mechanically sound spin, but they're not able to stop that spin once the snowboard comes in contact with the snow again. And then either, either needs to stop by uh, spotting the landing and with the eyes and stopping the rotational movement by um, using your field of vision and in where you're looking. It may be stopped by controlling the, the extremities and what your arms are doing. And quite often it can be stopped by um, basically flexing down through the legs once the snowboard hits the snow, uh, flexing down to kind of redirect that rotational momentum into more of a vertical momentum and stop the spin along with a little bit of a grip from the edge. But the ability to stop the spin, I would say, is probably the biggest struggle for a lot of candidates on the level three. Um, and when, it, when we're talking about creating con con and controlling rotation, we're, we're not necessarily looking for um, the 360. So there's always sort of been the, the perception that if, if I'm gonna pass the level three, I've gotta be able to do a 360. And uh, a 360 performed, a mechanically sound 360 performed well and stopped on rotation. That's a great way to demonstrate that you can create and control rotation. So a 360 is a good way to do it. Um, so is a 180. And depending on the feature that you're doing it on, a 180 performed over a box or, a, or even a rail with um, controlling the rotation on the exit, that might be a good way to do it. A slow controlled 180 over a jump as well showing that control of the rotation or the creation at the takeoff, the control of the rotation in the air, and then the stopping of rotation on the landing, that could show that as well. So we've really moved away from identifying the specific tricks that we're looking for, because it's possible to do a 360, but do a 360 that is not mechanically sound. 
Um, the same way it's possible to do a toe side turn uh, that isn't mechanically sound or a heel side turn that isn't mechanically sound. So we're, we've really moved away from identifying the actual trick that we're looking for, and it's more about the mechanics that we're looking for. Um, and then the last point is demonstrates the use of pressure to create errors by using the appropriate pop or ollie movements at takeoff as required by the terrain and conditions. So this is more of a timing and a pressure sort of idea where can you tap into the flex of the board, uh, pair that up with the shape of the terrain that you're trying to jump off of and use those two things to generate lift rather than just jumping and using the muscle muscular force of jumping into the air. Can you use the flex in the snowboard and the subsequent release of the snowboard to get yourself into the air? Um, that's a big question there for that one. So uh, as I said, on the freestyle side, it really is basic level skills. And with some time and some good coaching and some good training from a trainer, uh, it really is attainable from, from most people. Um, and it's really important. I, I personally feel not being a park guy and not being a park rider, um, you know, that's never been a, an area of strength for me, but I really do feel that it's important that an advanced instructor who could potentially be teaching anybody has at least the ability to take someone in the park and, and, uh, show them some basic skills and be able to kind of walk the walk to some extent there. Um, and that's the big one, but I wouldn't make the freestyle, um, evaluation a bigger thing than it needs to be. It tends to get kind of turned into sort of this big, this monster that really it beats people before they even get there because they turn it into a real source of anxiety. So, um, you know, approach it with, if you can try to approach the freestyle evaluation with a certain level of kind of uh, confidence and calmness by doing the work ahead of time and knowing that you can show these things and, um, and you should be fine in that, in that aspect. So then finally, the last, the last part here is the instructor training skills. So this is your ability to pass on teaching skills to new instructors. Uh, and improve their teaching. So the, the main concept here is teaching in introductory and tra instructor training sessions in accordance with Cassian technique and methodology. So on the right hand side, some of the specifics, so it clearly establishes the goal for the training session. So right off the bat, establishing today, we're gonna be working on um, incorporating better demonstrations into our teaching, and we're gonna look at the uh, control phase of quick ride to, uh, to get this accomplished introduces the session clearly and effectively. So part of being a good instructor trainer is that uh, effective communication skill and that ability to be positive and um, assume some leadership. Clearly distinguishes between the role of trainer and instructor. So one of the big aspects that we cover on the instructor training module of the course is this difference between teaching the public where it's instructor to student and now it's trainer to instructor. So we're adding kind of another layer or another uh, level to the onion skin here. So um, knowing uh, some tactics to help your group understand where you, when you're speaking to them as the trainer to the instructor and when you're speaking to them as the instructor who would be teaching the, the public. Uh, structures the session in a logical format and we talk about um, some tools and some uh, ways to structure the session in a way that makes sense. Uses questions as a tool in interacting with the group. So a confident leader who trains instructors will be confident to throw out some questions and uh, react to the answers that they get back. And then provides realistic tactics and tools that instructors can provide in their lessons. So the big takeaway message from the instructor training um, aspect of the level three is at the end of your session, your group should be able to walk away um, with something that they can apply to the next lesson that they teach. So what's the takeaway message? So when you go and teach your next lesson, uh, try to incorporate this aspect of teaching and it'll make your teaching better. That's really the um, kind of the sign of a successful instructor training session or not. <clears throat> um, and then we get into the marking scale or the marking system side of it. So really this is just a bit of a um, assessment scale that shows what's involved on the teaching skill side, what's involved in an above standard, a meet standard and a below standard. And we mark the teaching skills according to the to the practical teaching skills here of guest service and safety, communication and lesson structure, demonstrations, analysis and improvement, and technical content. Uh, same thing with the riding. So what constitutes an above, a meets, and a below for the groomed and the ungroomed and the freestyle. And then the instructor training. So the different parts of the session, the introduction, the demo, and then the wrap up. And what, uh, what really constitutes a, a below, a meets, or an above standard there. 
So that's kind of it for the, the standards overview. Uh, as far as the rest of this work, this uh, document, um, this is a review workshop of the instructor training, which we cover first, and the advanced competencies. A lot of this stuff is review, and this is covered in the ePrep that I mentioned earlier. We've got a lesson planning tool uh, here that'll help you to kind of go through some of the decisions and the thoughts that um, put together that advanced lesson, and then the same for an instructor training session. And then these are the technical presentations that the course presenters will follow when they're presenting this stuff. So there's the teaching uh, instructor training, the uh, riding or the, the advanced competency session, um, and that spills over into the advanced teaching as well. And then this is a copy of the comment form that you'll receive after the course. And then we've got the evaluation form that you would receive after the exam. And then some notes, uh, daily notes and feedback, kind of self-assessment stuff there. <clears throat> so that's about it uh, for the level three stuff as far as the standard goes anyway. Um, I hope you guys found that useful. Please feel free to reach out to me by email or um, any other way if you, uh, you have a direct line to me for sure. Um, we'll try to put together some more info like this that's hopefully helpful for you in, uh, in deciding whether these different courses and these different programs are, are useful for you. And uh, yeah, any questions or anything specific, uh, fire it my way. And I hope that you, uh, hope that you found this stuff uh, overall really helpful. Thanks. Take care.